So just to thank everybody for introducing themselves and again, welcome. And it's a, it's a delight for us in Sailsh uh, to introduce our speaker for this workshop today, Dr. Will Lam, uh, a colleague of ours in Sailsh, of course, and he's a senior lecturer in Celtic and Scottish studies in the University of uh, Edinburgh, and also um, a Sailsh board member and on the uh, steering committee for the Sailsh project. He has many external appointments. Uh, he's on the steering committee of Fachler Nagalic, and he's also an, uh, an executive council member of the Scottish Gaelic Text uh, Society. Uh, there are many other external appointments, which we don't have time to go through them all at the minute. I don't want to be embarrassing you, Will, anyhow. And if I could just say a few words about the many projects that he's involved in. He's involved in projects uh, in the disciplines, the areas of linguistics, dialectology, corpus planning, computational linguistics, and probably the most relevant of which for today's purposes is uh, one of his new projects, the Gaelic speech recognition, which started its, its existence as a Salsha collaboration and has been ongoing since then. Um, so uh, without... Uh, further ado then I would ask Dr. Lam uh, to give a paper first and then we'll have an open discussion on the issue and he's going to talk with us today on the topic of automatic speech uh, recognition. Morning, thank you, Jara. Uh, um, so I'm Will Lam and um, I'll be yes talking about speech recognition today. Right, well for a minority language um, like Scottish Gaelic with you know, less than 60,000 speakers there's perhaps a surprising level of provision in language technology and language technology res resources, kind of broadly speaking. Over the past 10 years, researchers have developed things like part of speech taggers, lemmatizers, machine translation systems, an orthographic normalizer, a text-to-speech system, uh, uh, which is speech synthesis, a syntactic parser, which breaks the sentence down into its syntactic constituents and gives you the labels telling you what they do, a handwriting recognizer, and then most recently a speech-to-text system. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Speech-to-text is really the same thing as uh, speech recognition, just two different ways of saying it. So this talk will outline where we are with these tools and automatic speech recognition specifically, and then we'll consider what is necessary to move forward um, to more rec more accurate speech technology, in, in particular um, ASR or automatic speech recognition, and some of the things that kind of need to happen before we can get to that point. So these are the specific questions I'm going to try to address today. So what resources are available for developing Gallic NLP and ASR specifically? what Gaelic NLP applications currently exist and what's needed to develop a more robust and accurate ASR system for Gaelic. Um, some of you have been to some of my other talks about this subject will probably recognize some of the slides that I'm using here, but uh, you'd be glad to know that I've got some new ones as well. We've just uh, submitted a paper for the Celtic, um, Celtic Language Technology Workshop, um, which is gonna be held in Marseille in June. So, um, so, yeah, so I've got some extra graphs and things uh, to show you from the project. So I guess the first thing, although many of us today know it, what it is, uh, what is natural language processing or NLP? It's often described as the combination of linguistics and informatics. And up front, I should say that my background is really in Gaelic linguistics and ethnology, kind of folklore. I'm not a computer scientist. I can do a bit of coding, but um, for the various projects that I've been involved in uh, to date, um, most of the coding has been done by other people who are much more competent than I am. Um, I see my role in Gaelic NLP is really as an, like an active facilitator, although some of the work that I've done in certain fields like Gaelic morphology has found its way into some of the technologies that I'll discuss. If you have any very technical questions, I might not be able to answer them, but I can certainly put you on to the people who can. Um, okay, so why is NLP important for Gaelic? I think, um, you know, if, if it was important before the pandemic, it's become even more important um, after the pandemic. 
Now, the pandemic's really catalyzed changes that were already afoot in human society. A huge amount of our communication is either technolo technologically mediated, that is kind of human to computer to, hu to human, or it has the computer as the addressee. So we speak to the computer and this computer you know, speaks back to us. Um, some of this technology, of course, is incredibly frustrating. For example, when you're trying to contact uh, your bank and get through all the various layers of kind of passwords and um, you know prompts that you're asked, or if you're trying to make a complaint to a company um, where they're using you know basically chatbots and other things. But um, in an ideal world, uh, the same technology can be used to benefit human beings rather than hold them back, and um, to also benefit minority languages. With the rise of computational conversational agents, you know, eventually it won't be um, won't be too long before computers are kind of prompting us for responses. We'll be the addressees, and currently that kind of technology is overwhelmingly geared to well-resourced majority languages like English. Gaelic is already threatened, as all of us know, so it stands to reason that um, when it comes to those kinds of linguistic domains, you either open them up to Gaelic, so make it possible to use Gaelic for digital communication or um, in the case of you know this language situation english gets an even bigger share of the linguistic real estate and some of these tools can can really make a difference to people on our blog um, the gallic algorithmic research group or gadak um, are on the gadak blog i received a comment from a mother who's got um, a son who has got some learning difficulties um, and uh, she said that, you know, the work that we're doing for speech recognition is super important to her son. Currently, he can write, as it were, in English by dictating to his computer and then going back and editing for sense and errors. But um, he can't do that with Gaelic. If he wants to do that in Gaelic, he has to dictate to his mom and she's not a fluent speaker. So um, it's going through, you know, a, a, a very kind of strong filter there. If he could directly dictate in Gaelic, she says um, it would other, utterly change his world and those of other Gaelic speakers with learning difficulties and dyslexia. We do have a speech synthesis um, facility. So, um, and please bear with me, I've just uh, lost my mouse. It's kind of just completely disappeared from my screen. Oh, here, here it is, good. Um, so uh, we do have speech synthesis um, and that is Katie, the Gaelic voice, which is developed by a company that's a spin out from the University of Edinburgh called Seraproc. So if we could couple, you know, the work that they've done on speech synthesis with speech recognition, it could be a really, really powerful interface and, um, you know, set of tools for the Scottish Gaelic language. And that's a beautiful example, I think, you know, the case of um, this son who's dyslexic, um, of a real life use case for NLP that can benefit people's lives. Apart from creating new speech domains for Scottish Gaelic or replacing ones or kind of coexisting, as it were, um, you know, with ones dominated by English, NLP has got the potential to create new and better speakers of the language. We've seen some kind of forms of NLP being used in Duolingo. And of course, you know, the Gaelic Duolingo has now been accessed by over a million people. That's really impressive for um, a language with only, you know, perhaps 60,000 speakers or slightly less. And if we could find ways to harness the linguistic and cultural knowledge that exists inside a highly competent native speaker and teach it in a learner specific fashion, I mean, that would be a really, really strong tool. It would transform the entire Gaelic language community. In fact, although that vision is currently science fiction, it won't be someday. And we've got an opportunity now to put Gaelic, um, you know, slightly closer to that possibility. The Gaelic community itself is, um, pretty excited, I think, about the potential for NLP to improve the language situation. In November, um, GADAC, the Gaelic you know, Algorithmic Research Group, won the 2021 Innovation Award at the annual Gaelic Awards for our work on speech recognition. And um, that was a real, uh, you know, just kind of boost in, in our work. It was great to get that recognition. But I think most importantly, it just really showed that um, the Gaelic media can community and the Gaelic language community in general are um, very much on board with this, this kind of research. Now, there's no end to the things that we could work on. The limiting factors are data, expertise, and funding, of course. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, 
mainly kind of the data side of things. Um, before I do, I think it would be useful for those of you who don't really know what NLP is um, beyond kind of maybe what I've said today, just to look at the different types of NLP and where speech recognition fits into them. So broadly speaking, you can talk about two different main types of NLP. One is text-based and the other is audio-based. Of course, these aren't kind of mutually exclusive categories. And um, the ASR system, as I'll describe, um, uses elements from both. But anyway, um, text-based systems are things like part of speech taggers that, you know, given a set of tokens, and when I say tokens, you can interpret that as words if you like, basically, you know, bits of text bordered by what's called white space, you know, punctuation or spaces or whatever. Um, so it takes, um, you know, words and it will stick a label onto them saying if the words are things like nouns, if they're, you know, feminine nouns, masculine nouns, what case they're in, et cetera, or if they're verbs or whatever. So to tag them all for their part of speech, you can have other things like syntactic parsers, which do kind of a similar function, but more for, um, for sentence constituents or clausal constituents. You also have machine translation. Um, and I think anybody who's used Google Translate will know exactly what that is. In terms of audio, you get things like speech synthesizers and speech recognizers. And then if you look at a virtual assistant, like Siri or Alexa, um, they would combine you know, some of these different elements. Um, so apart from you know, text versus uh, audio, if you like, um, you can also look at NLP in terms of whether, you know, in the way that it's put together, in the way that it's programmed. It can um, be rule-based or it can be statistical. Uh, back in the days when these kinds of tools were first being developed, they were almost all rule-based. So somebody had to sit down and write hundreds, if not thousands of lines of code to basically tell the computer what to do with a particular language input. Um, and that has its advantage in some ways, or I should say that, you know, when you take that approach for minority language, um, it often kind of pays off quickly in the early days, because with minority languages, oftentimes you don't have a huge amount of data. So the, the limiting factor with a rule-based system, as you can imagine, is really that it depends on the human beings who are involved to kind of um, be uh, correct about the things that they're typing in and, you know, um, to be correct in terms of the type of design that they choose for the system. A statistical system um, is otherwise known as machine learning or you know, the, the buzzword artificial intelligence. It basically takes as an input um, an enormous set of data typically, and it tries to extrapolate or to learn different patterns within that data. So um, this is very, very complicated and sometimes a little bit unpredictable. Um, but the the general kind of axiom is uh, garbage in, garbage out, or as I learned today, uh, the abbreviation um, G G I G O, um, GIGO, I guess. Um, anyway, um, so if your if your data is good, if it's uh, you know if it aligns with your purposes, then you'll probably get a tool at the end of the day, that's going to work quite well for you. But if, you're, if your data is messy or if it's got other kinds of problems, then it doesn't matter how clever the computers are. They're probably not going to be able to give you a system that's going to work for you. Um, so Google Translate is an example of a system that uses a statistical approach. And of course, it's actually quite good today for a lot of things with Gaelic. But if you, as I found, you know, put in an older text in Gaelic and try to and ask it to translate that to English. Sometimes it struggles because it actually hasn't seen um, pairs between older Gaelic texts and um, you know good solid English translations of those texts. Now I'm not going to begin to um, you know talk about the the architecture of Google Translate, how it works, works, etc. I, I I only know a little bit about it. It's um. Um, way beyond the scope of what we're talking about today and way beyond my expertise. But um, there are tons of papers out there and Google documents, et cetera, that you can look at if you want to see how those kinds of systems work. Um, Google Translate's an example of an end-to-end -end system where basically you, you just bang a huge amount of data into this very complicated um, kind of black box type pipeline and it spits stuff out the other end. But neither the Google you know engineers nor kind of any average human being really understands what goes on in that black box. So that's one of the, the, the downsides 
of dealing with kind of a statistical approach versus a role-based approach. So going back to, um, you know, example of the text-based kind of rule, um, rule-based approach, actually in this situation, it's not, it's statistical. Um, part of speech tagger, just to show you what this looks like. So these are the tokens, ha and the coin vote on. Then this um, is the lemma. So these are the roots that it, um, it extracts from, from those tokens. And then it gives you the tag. And then in our system, it'll give you a gloss as well if you ask for it. So that's the kind of thing that, that you can do um, with statistical learning. It's a lot less complicated um, than dealing with speech recognition. Um, and so we'll start to talk about that now. So in terms of audio-based NLP, as I said, you have speech synthesis and speech recognition. Um, and speech recognition is often known as speech text or STT, speech synthesis being TTS or text-to-speech. So let's look at, um, just before we get into speech recognition a little bit more, we can, we can look at the core types of NLP in terms of what's available for, available for Gallic right now, both in terms of the tools and also the resources that are out there. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the modern technolo technology or language technology is kind of predicated. It's built upon using statistical um, machine learning. As I said, the more data you have, the better your system is going to be. A lot of systems today work um, in an unsupervised way. Uh, Google's you know, machine translation, as far as I'm aware, um, does this. And what I mean by that is, it doesn't rely on annotated data at all. So it doesn't rely on human intervention. They basically just cr crawl the web for tons of data in the target languages and then run that through their algorithms. But there still is a place, particularly for minority languages, um, probably any language and annotated data. So an example of that would be Mfaklubik, the wonderful um, lexicon that Michael Bauer mainly um, put together. And there's some other examples. So we can look at digital corpora, both in terms of annotated corpora and non-annotated corpora. Um, annotated would be um, the um, annotated representative corpus of Scottish, Scottish Gaelic, or ARCOSC, and that's um, about an 84,000 word hand-tagged um, corpus. And what I mean by tagged, um, well, if you go back to, to that, um, you know, a human being, um, namely me, at least to begin with, went through all those words and, and manually put in the tags. Um, then it was um, revised by another two people and updated into a new system. So that's that's an example of an annotated corpus. We also have non-annotated corpora, um, for example, corpus nagalic, which Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's around 30 million words at the moment. Um, other examples are Island Voices, the, the fine work that Gordon Wells has done um, interviewing Gaelic speakers, um, the width and breadth of uh, the Outer Hebrides and a few other places, I think. And then uh, the GD corpus, which is from the work of Kevin Scano. So Kevin, uh, in relatively early days or early terms for, for minority language and NLP, he um, set up a web crawler to grab all the Gaelic text that you could find on the internet. He did this to begin with, I think around 2006 or s around about that time anyway. Um, and he's updated it um, occasionally over the years. So, you know, these are, these are some examples of the kinds of things that you can use to build these, um, these tools. All of them have their place. Um, ultimately, once you have annotated data, then you can, build fairly robust tools that can that you can use for as scaffolding um, to approach the non-annotated stuff. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at speech recognition. It's amazing how many applications even a single resource can have. I mean, if we look at Mfaq Bic, for example, um, it's undoubtedly one of the most important sources that we have for NLP, you know, it's a, as a digital lexicon. Um, it's not open source, but um, Will Robertson and Michael Bauer have been very generous in providing the data underlying on Faklebic for different people working on research projects. And um, there are at least three really wonderful things that you can get from their work. One is the phonology, so the sounds of the language, the sounds of the Gaelic language. So they give you the head word like marak and then give you 
the um, a transcription in IPA or International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, of course, this is, well, not of course, but this is a relatively bad example for me to have chosen because the IPA is exactly the same as the, the um, just the Gallic orthography. But anyway, you can imagine in some cases it's quite different. You can get more morphological information too. So they tell you if it's a feminine noun, what case um, it might have, or at least um, what some of the endings might be, some of the suffixes might be for, for different things like, um, you know, the genitive uh, version of the word you know, being marakig or marake, and then what happens with the plural marakan. So all this stuff is um, organized by them. All of this information and knowledge is organized by them into, in a database. So what are some, some of the things, oh, sorry, one more thing, the semantics. And this is underexplored when it comes to Scottish Gaelic, um, the meaning of the words and the networks that exist between the meanings of different words. We've done a little bit of work on this, um, but there's a huge amount more that could be done. So what has their lexicon enabled so far? Well, we built our lemmatizer um, using the word forms from the Fakhla Bic. The phonetic lexicon gives you um, the ability to start working towards speech recognition and speech synthesis. Um, the word forms that Michael put together have been used for a spell checker um, using Hunspell, which I think is available in LibreOffice now. Um, and then there's some other things that, that we can do. We've constructed an orthographic normalizer. So this is um, a tool that takes as input any Gallic text, and it can be written in kind of an older form of the spelling, you know, using an older spelling system, and it will update it into the Gallic orthographic um, conventions of 2009. Um, currently, it gets about 95% right, but um, we're hoping to improve that so it's a little bit closer to 100% in the next six months. Um, that project will be starting anew, um, thanks to Borsch and the Gallic for funding, um, and that'll be happening uh, next week. And finally, you know, with the morphological information, you can develop a grammar checker. That's never happened for Gallic, but it seems like a no-brainer that it will happen at some point. Um, if nobody else does it, I think I'll take a stab at it in, in a couple of years. So it's quite a lot just from that one resource. So while annotated text or annotated resources like in Fakhla Bic are hugely important, um, as I said, non-annotated text has, it pla has its place too. So the Kruipadan uh, corpus is about 5.7 million words of web, web crawl text. And um, you know, that coupled with these other kinds of texts, you know, from say Corpus and Gallic or Island Voices, um, these could be really useful for ge generating what's called a language model. Anytime you've, if you've ever used predictive text, you're basically dealing with a language model. It takes as an input, you know, a series of words and it tries to anticipate what the next word or words might be. In fact, the, you know, the most complicated systems, uh, the ones that are built, built for English, you know, English or other large languages using data sets of, you know, a billion words or more can do pretty wonderful and crazy things like, you know, writing fiction or writing poetry or writing news articles. Um, and of course, that um, comes with all kinds of, um, you know, wonderful opportunities as well as dangers, as have been talked about recently. Um, we hope that we'll have um, another 7 million words by 2024 on the back of a project that's currently running to take all the transcriptions from the School of Scottish Studies archives, tail archive, which is a sub archive, and um, to put them all into normal kind of digital text. Um, we're using a handwriting recognizer to, to do that work. So at the end of the day, we're hoping we'll have, you know, several million words, um, perhaps um, a couple score of million words to, to kind of throw at this stuff. Um, if you're interested in that idea of the, you know, the language model and what language models can can do. Um, I've given you a link here. I've just shared this. I've got a subscription to New York, the New York Times. Um, this appeared uh, the other day. It's quite an interesting article. It's not perfect. Um, and it's kind of a little bit, um, uh, what's the word? There's a little bit of, um, uh, you know, Barnum in there just kind of um, upping the whole thing or, or glorifying uh, things make and making some slightly unrealistic claims. But anyway, um, it is a very interesting article. So do check it out if you're interested to know more about language models. Um, we used a, a, a neural network based language model in the speech recognition project. And, and I'll come back to that in just a wee sec. So just to look at the currently available Gallic NLP tools, we mentioned machine translation. Um, 
mentioned speech synthesis, um, lemmatization, parse speech tagging and parsing and handwriting recognition. And you'll recognize some of these, maybe some of them you won't have, you won't recognize, but um, we all know what Google Translate's like. There's Intergaelic, which is a really nice app that Kevin Scannell developed for translating between Scottish Gaelic and Irish, and that uses an, an Irish language model to do um, the brunt of that work. Um, Sarah Prox voice synthesizer, um, you can get, just you know go onto the web and you can actually get that for free um, as long as you're not using it for commercial purposes. And it's, it's pretty good. I mean, the technology has moved on a bit since they developed that, um, but it's still very useful and very clear. And then the Gaelic Linguistic Analyzer, um, which is here, which does, as I mentioned before, part of speech tagging and a few other things. Okay, that's just a blown up version of that. So before we began working on speech recognition, we needed to, to get enough data to actually kind of develop our first models. And in order to do that, we went to a few different places. Um, one was the, the texts that came from the School of Scottish Studies archives. The School of Scottish Studies archives has the largest, I believe, collection of transcribed natural Gaelic speech in the world. And it's in really rich idiomatic Gaelic. Unfortunately, the, the, um, the audio recordings were done in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. So in some cases, they're not that clear, but the actual language itself is, is really, really good quality. And of course, there's a huge amount of dialectal variation there. So we thought whatever we do with language technology, we want to start getting some of this data into a form that we can use it more readily. So we started with a, a pilot project that was funded by the University of Edinburgh to do handwriting recognition. And we used um, a platform called Transcribus to do this. And basically Transcribus learns um, from being presented with well transcribed data. So you give it, um, you know, the handwriting that you want to transcribe, as well as, um, you know, a human's transcription of that. And then you build a model and then you go back and you take your model and you automatically transcribe, say, I don't know, a couple hundred pages. You get a human to come back in and correct that transcription because it won't be perfect. And then you build another model and then maybe another model after that and just kind of keep going back and forth until you get a really good handwriting recognition model. So we did that and we got a model that um, recognizes up to about 95% for the primary hand. So the primary transcriber for the Gallic material in the Terrell archive. And that gave us um, a couple of hundred thousand words to play with. And the advantage of, of having done that work is, well, we, we, we have access to the audio too. So when we're looking at speech recognition, we want to pair that textual data with the audio data, um, because we're going to try to tell a computer or try to help a computer learn what the association is between sound and words and written words because again it's a um uh it's a speech to text system so let me turn now to talking about the asr project so this began um as crawford said at the beginning with a generous grant from sayushi um so we started with a pilot project in september 20 and the project ran until 2021. We had a, um, another bit of funding from, um, from the DDI initiative, as well as the Scottish Funding Council. So we got almost a year out of this and our goals were to automatically transcribe Gaelic narrative audio. So specifically, we wanted to have the capacity to go into say, audio recordings held by Topol and or the School of Scottish Studies archives that hadn't been transcribed and to provide a rough transcription of them so that a human could come back and fix it. But um, that would take less time than starting from the very beginning. So that was the, the emphasis of this project. We also wanted to produce an orthographic, orthographic normalization tool. And the reason for that is that so much of the possible language model building data that exists for Gaelic is in older forms of orthog orthography. Um, so if you look at, the out of copyright material that's held by Dask, there's, I mean, again, Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's over 10 million words of this kind of early 20th century and then 19th or 18th century data. And currently we can't really use that um, for building language models because the spelling is all over the place. 
So we tried to develop a tool that would take any kind of older text and put it into modern orthography so that we could use it for NLP purposes. And then the third um, task here, the third goal was really to, you know, to do these kinds of things to aid Gallic revitalization. We were um, moderately successful at the first two goals. The third goal is kind of a, more of a long-term goal and we'll see what happens, I think, in the next five to 10 years. So let's look now at what the components are of an automatic speech recognition system. I've touched on these, um, I've just kind of foreshadowed a few of them as we've been going on, but we need a lexicon, we need an acoustic model, and we need a language model. Now, there, there are different ways of building ASR systems. You can have end-to-end -end systems, basically, where you know, you've just got a huge amount of data, huge amount of text, huge amount of audio, and you tell the computer just to go away and, and automatically learn the connections between them. With Gallic, we don't have enough enough data, anywhere near enough data for that kind of an approach. So we have to take a more kind of compartmental approach to doing this. So we used a very kind of um, uh, traditional way of building an ASR system. So the lexicon is a list of words and their phonetic pronunciations. So it's a phonetic lexicon. We got that original information from Michael Bauer's database. A language model, as I mentioned, is um, is a computer application that tries to predict the next most likely word given a sequence of words. So if you were to take um, you know, a Gallic system and type in nostalgian, it would probably spit back unichtje, nostalgian unichtje. Um, so it would know what the, the third uh, most likely word would be in that sequence. An acoustic model is an application that, you know, given the input of speech audio, tries to predict what the most likely phoneme sequence is that links to that. So if you have the input being in English, you know, good morning, the output would be like ga, u, da, ma, et cetera, um, in whatever phonetic representation you're using. In order to do the, in order, in order to build these kinds of things, you need to clean up the data that you're using. So um, one of the things that we had to do early on was figure out how to normalize the data. So it might seem a little bit strange for people who are used to reading Gallic, but we had to get rid of some of the things that, um, you know, we kind of take for granted. Things like punctuation, things like capitalization, things like, um, you know, dates that are written out with numbers. So in that case, that was quite an interesting task. We had to teach the computer how to take basically any date and put it into um, a verbal format. We also had to take out any kind of extraneous stuff like speaker um, tags and things like that. So with that input, this is what the output would be from our text normalization system. Once we had gotten some audio and some well-formatted text that corresponded to the audio, we could use what was called forced, what's called forced alignment to start moving towards a speech recognition system. And to be honest, at the point that we started, uh, Mark Sinclair, who was our uh, speech recognition consultant, he said, you know, we'll be lucky even just to get a really good uh, alignment system without even going down the route of getting, you know, speech recognition happening. Um, as it turned out, we were able to do, to do both. But uh, so alignment, well, I should say, you know, because we've got a reasonable amount of this transcribed audio paired with the original recordings, we can start training acoustic models using force alignment. So the aligner picks up global speech features, so acoustics, to make a good guess at when each word is spoken in, uh, uh, in, a, in a video. So to put this in a kind of con concrete way, um, many of you may be familiar with the Island Voices project that I mentioned before that Gordon has been running for a long time. And Gordon's data was really useful to us um, at the beginning when we were looking for transcriptions as well as uh, good solid audio. Gordon had excellent transcriptions. He also had the audio from you know um, where those transcript transcriptions came. So we were able to automatically subtitle his videos using forced alignment. But basically, the computer looked at the transcription and tried to pair it with where people were you know, talking. So if you had a sequence of words trying to find in the audio where those words occurred. Um, 
the company that we worked with, the company that Mark was working for is called Quart Technology Limited, and they're real experts in this kind of thing. Um, so we're able to do that, but in order to, to even get to that stage, we had a serious challenge in front of us. And that was that that type of system relies on an acoustic model, and we didn't have acoustic, an acoustic model for Gallic at all. So we had to find a way of using an English acoustic model to recognize Gallic, and we did that using phone, phone set mapping. So we were able to do this because Michael had spent all those many years typing out IPA for all of the, the words in Unfakla Bic. And what we did is we went through a process where we would take, um, you know, a word that say, you know, existed in one of Gordon's transcriptions like Ishke, and we would break that um, into its phonetic components. So we trained what's called a grapheme to phoneme model. And we did that using the data that Michael had. So we, we took all of his IPA and all of the head words that corresponded to the IPA and then to told the computer, right, go away and figure out what is this sound in you know IPA? What's that letter represent in IPA, et cetera? And it's quite clever because look at this. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence as anybody who, who knows Gallic will, will know, you know, you, well, that's easy enough. That's just a single vowel. But the IS is actually, you know, those are two graphemes, but it's one phoneme in Gaelic and it's a sh sound. Um, so it did quite a clever job of working out what the, the Gaelic IPA would be. Then we took that and put it into more standard IPA. Um, so there are some slight differences between what Michael did and what linguists in general would, would do in terms of IPA. And then we, we changed that into a system called ARP, ARPABET. This is a very simple kind of cut down uh, phonetic representation system specific for English. And it sounds crazy, but we were basically kind of almost like taking the computer uh, as if it were like an English speaker and trying to teach it how to recognize Gaelic using English sounds. As I, I'll say in a second, you know, that was not the end goal. It was just, um, it was a stepping stone to where we wanted to be. So finally, we converted that into the court system. So that way it was easy enough to build, um, uh, to start building the acoustic model that we needed. And this G2, G to P model, so the graphing the phony model was really accurate, 96% accurate. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but it's good enough for what we needed to do. Um, and then at that point, we were able to do automatic subtitles. A really amazing and unexpected benefit, um, you know, working with Gordon, we got all of his videos and most of them subtitled. And, and a great benefit, as I said, that was unexpected was that because they're on YouTube, then you could take advantage of um, Google Translate. So anything that was in Gaelic could be in any number of languages, um, you know, across the world. So that was that was quite wonderful. We go with my machine, ha fallen a bit more. I was just just a bit go with crew that learn ha can't talk for sure me. I was be a car gosh to still be here to learn. I was to be all of it. So, you know, even like stepping away from language technology for a second and thinking about language pedagogy, um, I know when I started learning Gaelic that I had a really difficult time associating sounds with words. Um, it took me years, you know, to get to the point where I could have listened to, say, Archie, you know, speaking there and actually know what he was saying. But when you have, um, when you have an alignment system like this, you know, when you've got subtitles appearing that quickly on the screen, it's, it can really help you, I think, as a language learner. So this is, you know, this is actually quite simple technology, but um, it's incredibly useful. And I think the response that Gordon got um, from his work was was really, really positive. So... That's um, you know example of the language um, of the automatic translation that you can get on um, on YouTube. So we could take everything that Archie said and and put it into into rough English. So that's exciting and fantastic in its own right. But it's not speech recognition. So to do speech recognition, you take the input speech. We try to you know use the acoustic model to estimate what each sound is in terms of its phonemes. And then we use the lexicon and language model to constrain that into orthographic words. So that's it in a nutshell. So how did we get on? 
Well, I'll play you a quick video, um, which is kind of the apex of the system. This is the last um, model that we did, last set of models. And um, this is really a little bit kind of biased. This is a really clear speaker and a, and a really clear recording, but it just shows you kind of how far you can get with only a, a modest amount of data. As I'll say in a minute, um, you know, we only had 103 hours of training data here. And even with that, it still worked pretty well. As Misha Madanish Ganesh, Agus Lukogmi as Nirker, Fashk is three fichet as Jay, Blionadash. Hamakinjach Gerer will me Dunan a Berkhog, Sismurgen is a Nimatar Shorrut Hachad, number Vehe, Agus Joel as a Homi, a Dimatarut, Ach Hanur and me gonna be Dunan Tangel. Homa Sava Vehe on the Nimata Imata Toy. Now the Rukumi me, Harawanach Glevik the Blionachan as Joey a hockey. Get a half for Akan, you know, the version of fast sewers as a new good. So, as I say, this is kind of the top end of accuracy that we found. But there, I mean, I haven't, you know, I haven't analyzed this, but I'd say we're up there in, you know, above 90% accuracy. It's not like that for every video. It's not like that for every recording, nothing like it. But in an ideal situation and, you know, dealing with the kinds of recordings that you might get from these types of interviews or, or really well-recorded speech on the radio or um, on TV, we might be able to, to get somewhere close to that. And certainly in a few years, we'll be, we'll be getting that regularly. So to, to just very briefly talk about the process. So we took an initial set of Gallic audio and text data. So, so audio paired with transcriptions as well as just tons of text um, on its own. We did an alignment process with the English model and then eventually we got a Gallic acoustic model and we were, you know, were able to train that iteratively, basically um, you know, getting it to, to listen to audio, print it out, as text and get someone to correct the text or to add more data in and then over time the accuracy went up so here's this new gallic audio and text data going in to the pipeline and improving the accuracy so we had as i said 103.5 hours of audio we had uh, about eight and a half million more of text there's a perplexity score if any of you guys are nlp nerds um, and we got uh, a word error rate from this system um, of about 26.3. So that's 73.7% accurate, which isn't great, um, but it is very impressive for this amount of data. What that means is basically three out of every 10 words are incorrect. Um, it's still quite useful. You can use it for lots of things. And in some cases, as you saw, the accuracy is much better. You can see starting with you know 21.2 hours of data and moving up to 103 you can see that the word error rate dropped by um, about 10 percent or so but you get diminishing gains over time so as you can see i mean this is a logarithmic scale i think um here we are at 35.8 our accuracy there with about you know 20 000, uh, sorry tw um what was it i can't remember how many yeah 20 21 hours of data the best systems today are way beyond 10,000 hours, but in, in order to get to clo you know, close to human parity, you need about that amount. We're aiming for somewhere around, I guess it's here or so, in the next uh, three to four years. So that would be about 5,000 hours. And we'd expect um, you know, with that kind of system around maybe a word error rate of, of 10%, so 90% accurate. So that's where we are right now. And that's where we hope to be by 2024. Actually, I would move that up even further because I know now, as I'll talk about in a second, that we've got a lot more data to work with. With that system, we were able to develop a prototype web, prototype web service. Um, and that uh, eventually will mean that anyone, anyone will go on, be able to go onto the web and automatically um, you know, just down, download all the models and talk to the computer and get stuff back. I'll give you a demo of that in a few minutes. Um, so let's just talk very briefly about the future. 
our future goals are um, things like experimenting using multilingual, mainly Irish language data to bootstrap or to improve the kinds of results that we're getting for, for Gaelic. And the reason that we would do that is that Irish is much better resourced than Scottish Gaelic. It's also a related language. So we can take advantage of the advances that they've made in this area and the data that they've got. We're also going to look at crowdsourcing data acquisition. Um, I've got a, a small grant from the Scottish government to help move us in that direction. And we're going to be modeling that to an extent on the fine work that's been done um, between DCU and UCD in Ireland, um, where they're getting people to correct handwritten documents um, in a kind of crowdsourced way. Well, correct and transcribe. And then we're going to hopefully in the next few years do, be doing things like, um, you know, these applications of ASR, providing live Gaelic subtitles on radio and TV. That's definitely within our, you know, five-year plan. Um, doing automatic searching or indexing of audio content online. For example, you know, you're looking for a subject in Tobin and Dolchish um, and you just want to, you know, find like all of the audio in Gaelic that is about witches. I don't know. I mean, just, you know, a random subject. Even if they haven't been transcribed, our, you know, our system will be able to go into these and find um, high likelihoods that particular recordings involve, you know, the word banavuchach or buchach or something like that. And then eventually we want to do things like enabling coaching of Gaelic phonology on things like Duolingo. So what do we need? We need a huge amount more speech data, both audio and text. If we had 5 million, sorry, 5,000 hours of spoken Gaelic, we'd end up with a corpus of about 25 to 30 million words. And that doesn't maybe sound very big in a, minor, in a majority language context, but that's about the current size of DASC. So it is pretty large for a minority language. Um, so how do we get that speech data? Well, I think from three places, the BBC, MG Alapa, and the School Scholar Studies Archives. I had a look at um, the BBC's resources um, a few weeks ago, and just looking at one program, Konyak Mekir, which is a talk show that ran for 29 years, in fact, um, on, on Radio Nangail, the Gaelic radio, that uh, there are 5,400 episodes of Konya Makiever. I mean, what a hero he is. That, that would give us about um, three to 4,000 hours of audio data on its own. We can use the Neachen, um, the bulletins that go out at 11 o'clock every day on the web. So you've got audio as well as text. And that would give us about a hundred hours, but that would be very valuable because we're getting both audio and text with Kanyak Makira, we'd just be getting the audio. And then we can get 500 to 600 hours of audio and transcriptions from the Tower Archive stuff that we're working on right now. And that would give us 5,000 hours. So I'm just gonna draw to a close now. Um, if you want more information, do check out our blog at the Gallic Algorithmic Research Group. Um, I'll give Gordon the slides from this presentation, so be free to click on any of the links that are here. Um, you can look at uh, the Twitter feeds from myself, Kevin Scano, and Michael Bauer, also uh, the proceedings of the Celtic Language Technology Workshop. There have been three of the fourth this, this year, and we've got a paper on ASR that will appear in the proceedings, we hope anyway, um, at some point. Um, a big thanks to our funders, Scottish Funding Council, Sayesha, um, Arts and Humanities Research Council, Borsna Gaelic, the Carnegie Trust, and Data Driven Innovation, and our many, many external partners. Um, and I've mentioned a few today uh, the BBC, Guhan Nyelan, Island Voices, um, and the School of Scottish Studies Archives, Tobin Dochish, etc. There are others that I haven't mentioned. Um, so, just to bring us to a close, here's a taste of the new web system that we developed. Am ian dochus can dochorsh an dis a hulidinye. Moran taing gif ulig. Taing hult weil vashin er le inchinach. Thanks for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, you, if, uh, if you want to move on from ac academia at some stage, you could move into engineering, that your approach to it. it you, you took all the inputs, the components, and assembled them in a very, very clear way. That the, the way you built uh, what you've achieved is very clear in that presentation.